Hello. Hello. Oh, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, I want to go back to the days of Honey Bunch when you were galloping oh. across the fields of Gloucestershire, because that's where you grew up, wasn't it? Gloucestershire. Yep, Cheltenham, only half a mile from the race course. So, you know, I really feel for Cheltenham. But Honey Bunch was badly named. He was a horrible little so and so. You know, if you went to catch him, he'd turn his back on you like they do, you know, and you go nearer and he'd trot off you know horrible and my sister used to lead me i didn't want to ride used to lead me before school her on a bicycle and me on honey bunch with a rope and we'd, we'd be going along the lanes you could do it in those days we go along the lanes i'd be on the grass verge she's on the road and she'd say right you know how the teachers do it right we'll trot now you know <laughs> and then she, we'll canter down oh i don't want uh, you know, I jump off. I'm a horrible little boy, horrible brat. And uh, she got round that by not saying we'll canter. One day, she just slapped the horse on the backside and let it go. Oh wow! Of course, well, you know, Hannah. Once you've had speed, you think, well, isn't this better than this trotting bit? You know? Yeah. So is that then how you got your love for speed? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was no intention of making it a, a living. You know, it was. Just the fact that I failed nine O levels at school, and what else does a small lightweight do? So, did you go to a riding school or anything? No, uh, but my sisters rode, and my parents rode occasionally, just fun riding. Uh, we, well, we we did a few shows, but uh, you know, it wasn't very good. the The only cup I had was a nice size, you know, big cup, two silver handles on it, and it was for the best under sixteen rider at the Cheltenham Horse Show. But it only dawned on me years later that my father being chairman of the show might have had some influence on that. That's a good advantage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lots of wins. So from then, so you said from school, you didn't get many O-levels. So from then, is that when you pushed yourself towards racing? I got zero from oh. nine. I mean, they're, uh, GCSEs now, aren't they? You know, but zero from nine. And I was at Tewkesbury Grammar School. It, it, I, I wasn't thick. I was always in the top three in every subject. In my mocks, superb. Come the examination day, I think I was just cocky. I didn't read the questions. And it's so important. How can you answer if you don't know what you're answering? I read the first few lines and go, you know, diddly squat, and away I went. Uh, I, I often thought I should sit them again, and then I thought, but wouldn't it be awful if I failed them all again? <laughs> be a complete waste of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I read somewhere that it was a member of your family that was in the racing industry. Yep, yep. My sister married a jockey, um, <coughs> excuse me, called Paddy Cowley, an Irishman, obviously, and he was doing well. Um, and around Cheltenham in those days, there were 10 trainers and they trained up on top of Cleve Hill you know those lovely photographs we get on ITV looking down from it we used to just going up from Presbury Woodman Coat and Oaks South and the villages there just getting up onto the hill would make a horse half fit and, and then there's 3,000 acres of common land there I mean we could gallop forever you know it was brilliant uh, and as I say 10 trainers lots of gold cup winners etc etc um, and so there were, there were jobs around where I lived, but the premise of if you go to a small stable, you'll get the rides is correct. But when they've got a fancied one, they're going to get a jockey, you know. I mean, I got the hard pullers, one eye, bad legs, but it got you going. But, but how I went four years as a professional jockey in different small stables without a winner. 60 rides. I mean, that was horrendous. You know, how anybody continued, continued rather, to give me rides, I don't know. So what then kept you motivated to continue with it and not give up? 
<laughs> what else could I do? You know, and but but I did work it out eventually. I worked out that if you went somewhere where there were lots of winners, the crumbs off the table would be enough to feed you. And uh, I knew from being in the weighing room for that, that time that Fred Winter, who was champion jockey, was about to retire at the age of 39, which was late in those days. Jockeys, Josh Gifford, um, the late Josh Gifford, lovely man, retired at 29 and other people went 30, 30. But Fred Winter had gone on to 39, so I approached him and said, look, you know, you hardly know me. You're at the top end where the radiator is in all the changing rooms. I'm down by the loo. But, oh, he said, oh, no, I, of course I know you. He said, you, yeah, you, you, ride, you ride well, you're honest, and horses jump better for you than most people. Uh, so he said, you, you can have a job with me. I'm going to start in June. And he said, you'll have to fight your corner because there'll be other lads wanting rides. You know, you won't be staying with Jockey, of course. You'll just get whatever you get. And um, his letter to me then, so that was, oh, I don't know, probably February. His letter to me in April, May said, uh, I mean, it's quite public school attitude, really. Not dear Richard or anything. You know, we're jockeys in the same room, even though I'm low down. He, it was Pittman. Um, I'd like you to start on June the 1st. Um, it's, it's lovely and sunny and warm. You'll be the first person here, along with two others will join later in the week. We don't have any accommodation, but I've got a very good tennis court changing room. And uh, he, it, it was wooden. And he said, it's summer, so, you know, you can bed down there until we sort something out. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that in this day and age? You, know, say, you have to live in the tennis hut. It sounds quite an adventure, actually. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you're young, you don't care, do you? You know, you, you, you just want to get your foot on the ladder. So what was Fred Winter's method of training like? Was that different to trainers today? Yeah. They all train differently. I mean, there were some great trainers in Lambour, and there was a good 10-foot-high wall between Fook Warwin, who trained three Grand National winners, Gold Cups, everything, and Fred Winter, you see, and we used to big rivalry. And Fred used to ride for um, Foot Warwin, uh, and, and uh, it was a lot of rivalry. You know, we'd say, "Oh, over the walls had a winner," you know, and um, so that's how it went on. And those trainers, Stan Meller started training. There were quite a few uh, well-established jump trainers. The Lambourne Gallops, gorgeous, and um, there's a, a round bowl on the grass and in all weather where you'd go a mile round and then it would straighten up and then go up a hill and you could go straight up the steep hill or go sideways so you know they were it, it wasn't interval training like we have now it was long training and um, Fred and I once we had a decent string we'd go up together first and do it and we'd walk down the hill a little bit and we'd sit there like Indians watching the string you see and of course they'd go around the bowl and then up the back of the hill and you could hear every word because it reverberated across even though it was some distance and on a cold frosty morning you could hear every word and you know the lads would be coming down and they'd be saying god the so-and-so old man's in a bad mood today isn't he and fred would just look at me and smile and said let that be a lesson you know when you're talking i can hear so, but great man so yes it was longer work um now in Lamb One, of course, got no end of a mile long or weather, a six foot long or weather, a round or weather, uh, two uphills, very, very steep, short but steep. They've got everything. It's, it's a fantastic place to, to train. But yes, that's a long answer to your question. Methods have changed amazingly. Do you think that was a better way of training, would you say, like longer distances? I, I, I can't say. I can't say because I, I've been out of riding work for so long. And it works now, doesn't it? I mean, everyone attributes Martin Pike to changing it. And of course he did. Straight uh, or weather going nicely uphill. Um, and what was very interesting about Martin, he was a bookmaker's son. His father came in one day and said, I bought a racehorse, you're going to train. You know, no absolute experience whatsoever but common sense and he was going to put his all weather around the edge of this field going up there and then he suddenly thought no 
it will put pressure on a horse's legs going that way and then that way. Straight line is the way to go. So it's, it's a famous gallop wood chip. And they were so clever, he even bought an old chipping machine and chipped his own wood for the, for the surface. But another thing that Martin was very clever at, you know horses get colic, tummy ache. You and I take a Rennie or whatever we, we take. A horse starts going like a dog who's going to sit down, you know, pouring up the straw because it, it wants to alleviate the pain and get down. That can kill it because of their in, huge intestines. As they roll, uh, the intestines can twist. And it's called the twisted gut, can kill them. And Martin said quite often it's because their bowels aren't working properly, you see. So he said, what makes a horse poo? Put it in a horse box as if it's going to the races. So if ever they had one with a sign of colic, they put it in the horse box, take it all around the villages, around where he trains in Somerset, bing, bingo. No calling the vet out, the blockage had gone. So why I'm saying this, it was, he was ahead of the game because he came from a clean sheet, not from a racing background. He didn't inherit ideas, he thought about his ideas. But anyway, that's, so, so just a quickly one. Everyone thinks Martin invented this interval training. But when I was a kid, the Queen Mother's trainer, Peter Caslett down in Kent, trained that way in a park, but only because that's all he had, was a two furlong strip up in the park, you see. So he actually did interval training without probably knowing what it did. You, you have to keep the heart rate up, you know, you, you canter up, canter down, half speed up, canter down, let them rip because you're keeping the heart rate up, but also lowering the pressure on them. It's fascinating. I love thinking, seeing how different trainers work. Yeah, just while we were talking about colic, my mum always taught me to feed horses bran if they've got colic to push it out. Would you say that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, nice bran mash. I, I don't know if people still feed bran mashes. We used to do it on a Tuesday, no, Wednesday night after a galloping day so that they had an easy day on Thursday and then give them a, a bran mash on a Saturday night because they had an easy day on Sunday. Whether they do that now with all these modern mixes, I, I don't know. I wanted to talk about the riding styles because thank goodness for YouTube because most things back in the day I wasn't alive so it's good that I can watch things. But I noticed that people rode longer in the leg. Am I right in mm. saying that? Why was that? It all changed. I mean, Years ago, before my time, and you know, I'm, I'm very ancient, but before my time, people rode full length. And you know, all these old photographs of Beecher's Brook, they are literally lying back yeah. on the horse's tail. And then we upped the game over the years. And then it upped again, although we did have some stylists ahead of their time. Andy Turnell, whose father trained, rode as short as Lester Piggott, over the national fences as Piggott rode on the flat and his balance was superb but over Beecher's Brook in the days when there was a big drop you had to let the rain slip through your fingers on landing you know you go in nice and stylish and get the, the stride right but as they're landing you would slip the reins and sit back because of the drop their noses often hit the ground and you needed your body as ballast to keep their bottom down because once it comes once the tail comes past your eyes you've had it <laughs> so um and and Andy Turnell used to ride a short then in those days with the big big drops but in 1975 he was slipping the reins like this going backwards and missed the buckle end of the reins and did a double somersault off the backside of the horse well self-preservation he's done that you see and he's grabbed Paul Kellaway who was landing on Verona quite happy thinking well that was good and the next thing they're both sitting in the grass holding hands oh my golly <laughs> but so uh, Andy was ahead of his time and there were other stylists the, the Queen Mother's jockey David Mould very stylish even though he rode a slightly longer the whole thing changed from America, really, with stirrups coming up, and now the toe, toe in the iron. 
although I've been brought to, to, to account several times because I'm quite critical of toe in the iron, I've seen jockeys on the flat fall off, you know, horse swerves, bong, and the commentators, oh, he could, nothing he could have done about that. Yes, there was. You know, if he'd had his foot in the iron, he wouldn't have come off. And, and I get a lot of stick, you know, then about it. And now they are riding, not actually with the end of the toe in the iron, but uh, diagonally across the ball of the foot. I, I thought this, this is what I wanted to ask you. And I wondered why that was, because it's almost, you're, you're turning your toes right in, aren't you? Yeah. They say, in their own defence, that, I mean, it's a style thing, you know, they're all doing it. Um, they say in their own defence that it alters their body weight on top of the horse and they can get down and more behind him. And that's probably so. I mean, we see all these videos of the jockey coaches getting young people going. It's all about getting very low on the neck, isn't it? And push, push, push. Whereas before people were more upright. As you know, it's all got to come from the pelvis. You know, you push forward as your bottom half of your body goes back to elongate the horse. If you can get its stride to elongate half an inch, quarter of an inch, in 10 strides, it's a short head. You know, it is so important how to push. And they do teach, they do teach this very well, the jockey coaches. I mean, Nick Fitzgerald, John Reed, all over the country, they've got them. One thing I'm going to ask them on Twitter very shortly is, can you explain, because you don't teach jockeys, why they're all bumping the saddle? You know, when they start pushing. Yeah. Okay, get down and behind them push, but some of them are going boom every stride, you know. Yeah. Sorry if I'm making you sit doing that. Um, but it, to me, it's ugly. It, 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 it cannot help them to be bounced on the spine. But anyway, you know, I'm a silly old, you know, you know, they say about jockeys, old jockeys, oh yeah, the fences were stiffer, they were higher and all this. But you know, you're entitled to an opinion, aren't you? Yeah, so when a jockey is stood up more, is there a reason for that? Because then, you know, when they're, um, you've got a group together and then you can really see the different levels of where the jockey is. Is that a reason for that? Yes. It's just a, a matter of what you do yourself. When they're standing up, I mean, you if you look at jockeys from the sideways, they can be more upright or, or down, but you need a sort of straight line down through the, the bulk of your body, whether your trunk is forward, as long as it's down through, through your, your hip to your knee, down into the horse. You, balance is so important. If you're unbalanced, the horse is unbalanced, isn't it? But no, you can still be more upright and still be correct. It, it's a matter of preference, really, isn't it? But you're right. When you look at them, you can tell jockeys by their stance, can't you? I mean, look at Bryony Frost now. Always got a head down, very low. Never pushes or pulls at a fence. She's right when she gets there. Her striding is brilliant. Um, she, John Franklin was, was, and still, in my opinion, one of the greatest men at a fence. He didn't push or pull. He was right when he got there because he was an international show jumper. And Bryony is saying, oh, incidentally, did you see the recent thing on all social media where she's been given, oh, what's the horse? Black horse, Black Corton. Oh, yeah. And, and she rode him, a first day rode him over Dartmoor with her father. It's brilliant. I mean, there's the love of, one of the loves of her life, you know, horses. And he's gone out over the moors. Oh, how brilliant. And, and they come to a, a little Ford uh, and, and she said, now come on Blackie, you know you can do this, you know, and have a look at it and then he goes through and, and then the next thing is she's jumping a row of gorse bushes. I mean, it is so lovely. Her, her empathy with horses is just marvellous. I mean, lots of people empathise with them, of course, but uh, she's done an awful lot for, for females. And how things have changed, Hannah, in my day, when I was riding winners, I had an old mini car, which I had to bump start it in the morning to get going. Um, Bryony's got an Aston Martin. The only other person I know in racing with an Aston Martin jumping is Venetia Williams. She has an Aston Martin for three days a week and a BMW 7 Series for the other four. You know, it's, but for Bryony, live for Bryony. You know, but can you just see her looking over the top? You know? <laughs> I saw in the interview actually you mentioned about a bit of a nerve-wracking experience when you were galloping through a fog. So have you had any other nerve-wracking experiences? 
Well, when you first get run away with, it's scary, isn't it? Because you're totally, I mean, presumably you have been, have you? I go across fields and I can't stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first time is always scary. Now, when I was at Fred Winters to start with, and the string went from six the first week to 50, and that's, that was the maximum they had in those days, Orwin, Fred Rymel, Fred Winter, the top people only had 50 horses. Now, although the big trainers won't admit it, they've got a call on nearly 300 because they have outlying yards who are bringing them on. And if I used to do it for local trainers, and if they had one coughing or got a leg, they'd ring you up and said, look, what have you got that's fit? You said, we've got these five, right. A box will get them, you see. So they've got a call on a lot of horses. So we only had 50 horses. And because I'd sort of established myself as the leader of the lads who were going to get rides, so that's, okay. I would be at the back and Fred Winter would be at the front. And in the summer, there was a, a, a dirt, I mean, the all weather thing was now, of course, a, synthetic things. It was just rotivated dirt in this circle. And we set off with 26 horses and he rode a horse called 177 who was so hard pulling, none of us could ever hold it. And he'd be in front. And he said, you go at the back, Richard, just keep your eye on things, you see. Below me, this thing took off and I was agonizing to hold it because once you go from 26th to 25th, you're upside at another one, you upset that. Mm -hmm. So I've gone tearing through them, upsetting them all and encour encouraging them all to run away. And about 10 of us whew, drowned Fred, the trainer, because we were all being run, and it was my fault. It was totally out of control. I mean, what goes through your mind is, you know, well, I'll just have to keep going all day until it's tired. Mm -hmm. Now, being out of control is, is not nice. But just going back to in the fog on Cleve Hill, there was a, there's a big cliff there, you see, and the fog disorientates. You don't know where you are, where you're going. I mean, we, no one did go over the cliff, but we, we could have done. And at the moment, it's just getting a resurgence. There's no, been, no trainers there for years. Emma Baker, who trained in a smallish way at Stone Old, has moved there. And Luke Harvey has just bought 26 acres in a bungalow, and he trains his own point-to-pointers. So it might get a resurgence.